in researching for the book, uh, and especially since the book came out, in talking to people who are reinventing their organization, I've learned something really interesting. Um, something that sounds quite inefficient. And that is that there might well be a real value in teams that are struggling, in teams that are reinventing the wheel, in people making mistakes. You know, we're, I think, so formatted in thinking that, well, whenever we can avoid a mistake, by any means, let's do it, right? Like, mistakes are inefficient. You know, if anybody is struggling, by any means, come and help them uh, so that they can go back to doing productive work. Um, but that might not necessarily be true in this transformation. Uh, the first time I came across that idea was when I heard Joss de Bloch say, that he felt that the very first teams that Birdsorg started back around 2007 um, received too much support. You know, they, they, they had a coach um, that spent a lot of time with them. And they felt that these teams didn't struggle as much as later teams. Um, and because they didn't struggle as much, they also didn't learn as much. They didn't come out of the process. Um, as strongly as other teams. And so now they've made a decision that, you know, they have a coach for something like 40 to 50 teams just to make sure that there's just no way that coaches can spend too much time helping teams. Because they feel that teams really need to go through this period of struggling and having to figure it out and having some conflict and that that really gets teams to understand what self-management is and to come out stronger and get more united as a team. Um, another time, more recently, I've come across this is when I talked to um, some leaders at Michelin. You know, Michelin is this uh, global uh, tire manufacturer, and they're doing something really quite unprecedented. Um, after doing some experiments in in various factories around the world, they're now inviting their seventy thousand um, operators, so the people working in the factories, um, to start working in what you could call self-managing teams. And they're adamant that they will not tell the teams how to operate. They will only invite the, the teams and share a number of principles, but no detailed practices, even though they could, right? So there's some teams that have experimented um, in a number of factories for two years, so they've really learned things that work. And so they could tell the teams, hey, here are some interesting practices you could use that other teams have developed. Instead, they're adamant about the fact that they will only share some general principles with the teams. Um, I don't remember the exact principles, but I think one principle might be um, that teams start to do a lot of things themselves. So the support functions, uh, like maintenance, etc., are only there on call, um, are only really support functions. Um, but they no longer you know, have a, a defining say in what happens in the team. Um, in some other organizations that do self-management, for instance, um, you know, there might be a general principle that the tasks that were done by the manager get now distributed across the team. But it's just a principle how you do that. You know, it's up to every team. Or I, um, I could imagine a team that goes towards wholeness um, and says, hey, as a first step, you know, where we want to introduce more real conversation is the recruiting process. Well, you might define some principles without defining exact practices, right? You might say to a team, hey, we don't want to um, hire people only for their skills. We're really interested as a, the person itself and how they resonate with our purpose and our new vision of how we operate. Um, or you could give as a principle, hey, during the recruitment process, we want to make space to discuss um, the candidates and the organization's hopes and longings and our, our history and where we're coming from and just make space for these deeper conversations as a principle, but not say how that should exactly look like. And I find that really fascinating. I mean, if you already know a practice that works well, why wouldn't you share that with the teams? Why would you let them reinvent the wheels, potentially struggle and fail um, when you already know what works, right? Um, and what people, for instance, at Michelin say is that, you know, there's real unlearning and relearning that needs to be done. 
And that can only happen when you're struggling, when you have to define things yourself. If you give people uh, a ready-made practice, you know, this is how we're going to do it, um, the risk, they say, is that people will simply adopt the practice without un understanding sort of the underlying perspective worldview. Um, and I find that quite, quite fascinating. Um, I'm such a geek for practices that I feel like, well, I want to share this, like, look at this, you know, this is so, this is so cool. Especially since I find that some of these practices are so different that it's unlikely that people will develop them themselves. It's unlikely that people will stumble upon them easily themselves, right? Um, maybe you remember the book, there's like this beautiful practice of how people can give each other feedback and annual evaluation that is used at this organization called Sounds True. Well, would people really stumble upon that? You know, wouldn't it be easier to just say like, maybe you want to do it this way? Um, and I had really interesting conversations around this question of when you invite teams to, you know, reinvent their practices, do you share with them just a number of principles or do you also share detailed practices? And here's where I've, you know, come out, um, is that I, I really believe there's value in what uh, Jos de Bloch or people like Michelin say um, is, you know, let people struggle, let people figure it out, let people grapple with the your principles because that's really how the unlearning and relearning happens. And yet I also see some value in, you know, offering some, you know, more detailed practices because there's some stuff that people might simply never um, come up with um, or, you know, just very rarely because they're just so different. And the way I reconcile this is to say, hey, maybe the best way is to offer some principles. And if you want to offer practices, offer at least two or three different practices. You know, your performance evaluation that invites people to more wholeness. Well, here's two or three different ways, you, you know, that some other teams um, have done it. Because in that way, it's very difficult to just add up one wholesale. You know, teams will have to look at, oh, but they're different. So which one do we like? And maybe we make a mixture. And so people go through some of the same process of, of learning or unlearning. Um, another possibility is, you know, you you invite people with only principles and after a while of looking at it you share some of the the practices um, but they've already had some time to grapple with things um, another really interesting implication i think is that this changed the roles uh, the role of leadership so in our traditional understanding of leadership leaders should avoid any mistake happening i mean that's sort of their core responsibility like as soon as they see any any mistake, anybody reinventing the wheel, you know, they should step in to make sure that everything is running smoothly and efficiently. And what this invites leader to is to observe and to say, hey, when is the right moment to step in? And you know, when should I just let people uh, figure it out and learn and potentially and potentially struggle? Um, I remember a vivid conversation with um, a large multinational organization and the uh, French unit. Um, was sort of the first one that had gone already quite far and they went through all sorts of mistakes and um, and learning and then you know they we talked about the fact that for them it was really painful to see other countries making some of the same mistakes and they said like how can we help them how can we intervene so that they don't make the same mistakes and we had a really interesting conversation about should they even do that or you know do you need to let other people make some of those mistakes and and maybe the word mistake is even too strong. Um, one thing, for instance, that I've noticed is that quite often you have pendulum swings. Um, people who, for instance, get rid of all sorts of policies and procedures and everything that seem to be so strict and bureaucratic and go towards sort of the other extreme of no structure, no policy, no rules, um, only to realize at some point that that isn't working either. And so then they start to restructure and um, and I've started to see that maybe that pendulum swing is just a natural part of the whole learning and unlearning process. Um, and so I invite you as leaders to be mindful of that and not necessarily to step in, not necessarily feel that it's your role to step in and solve problems and avoid mistakes and avoid people reinventing the wheel. Um, 
But carefully think about, is there actual value in what's happening? Um, it's not always a comfortable thing as a leader because other people still project onto you that you should be able to fix it or you should have foreseen this or you should have prevented this mistake from happening. Um, so it's, it, it can be uncomfortable um, that people have these expectations and you realize that that's no longer, that's no longer your role. So that's my invitation for you is just like me, start to grapple with this question of, is there value in people in teams struggling for a while in them possibly reinventing the wheel or in letting the pendulum swing too far before it comes back? Perhaps you've noticed there is no paywall, no monthly membership to access this video series. That's because the videos live in the gift economy. This is how it works. I gift everything that goes into making the videos, my time, energy, and insights, and you get to choose what feels right to gift back. Please take a moment to reflect on what would feel good to give in return to help me continue doing this work. Thank you.